Over 1,300 toxic waste sites across America remain on the federal cleanup list, and the average remediation takes more than 10 years to complete. 80 million Americans, roughly one in four people, live within three miles of one of these hazardous locations, and tens of billions of dollars have already been spent attempting to undo damage that began decades ago. The Superfund program has cleaned up more than 450 sites since 1980. But what stands out here is the sheer scale of what remains. 1,300 active sites still contaminate soil, groundwater, and communities across the country. Understanding how America arrived at this point requires going back to a working-class neighborhood in Niagara Falls, New York, where a 27-year-old mother named Lois Gibbs started asking questions that would change federal environmental policy forever. Lois Gibbs lived an ordinary life in a neighborhood called Love Canal during the late 1970s, and her son Michael attended the local 99th Street School. Michael had developed epilepsy, asthma, and a dangerously low white blood cell count which alarmed his mother enough to investigate. What she uncovered was horrifying. Between 1942 and 1953, Hooker Chemical had dumped 21,000 tons of toxic chemicals into an abandoned canal beneath that school. The waste included chlorobenzenes, dioxin, benzene, PCBs, and at least 12 known carcinogens. Hooker Chemical then sold that contaminated land to the Niagara Falls Board of Education in 1953 for exactly one dollar, and the school district built an elementary school directly on top of it just two years later. That single dollar purchase would eventually cost hundreds of millions to remediate. By the 1970s, chemicals had begun leaking into basements throughout the neighborhood, and children were being burned by substances bubbling up through the playground surface. Residents reported elevated rates of miscarriages, birth defects, asthma, leukemia, and neurological disorders, which prompted Gibbs to organize her neighbors into the Love Canal Homeowners Association. Armed with nothing but a high school education and a mother's determination, she went door to door documenting the crisis. August 7, 1978 marked a turning point when President Jimmy Carter declared the first federal emergency ever issued for a man-made disaster. Approximately 800 families were evacuated from Love Canal, and the images broadcast across the nation forced Congress to act. President Carter signed the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act into law on December 11, 1980, and Americans quickly gave it a simpler name. Superfund. The legislation empowered the federal government to respond to hazardous substance releases, clean up abandoned waste sites, and hold responsible parties financially liable for the costs. When no responsible party could be found or they had declared bankruptcy, a trust fund would cover the cleanup work. The Environmental Protection Agency received the enormous task of identifying and prioritizing the nation's worst contaminated sites they developed the National Priorities List using a hazard ranking system that evaluates groundwater contamination, surface water contamination, soil exposure, and air migration. Any site scoring 28.5 or higher on a scale of 100 becomes eligible for listing, and the first National Priorities List appeared in 1983. Love Canal was among those original sites, alongside the Valley of the Drums in Kentucky where photographs of 17,000 rusting barrels of industrial waste became an iconic symbol of America's toxic legacy. Those images helped galvanize public support for aggressive cleanup action. Congress strengthened the law six years later when President Reagan signed the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act on October 17, 1986 which also created the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry to study contaminated sites and assess health impacts. The Love Canal cleanup took 21 years and cost approximately $400 million before the site was finally removed from the National Priorities List in 2004. Occidental Chemical, the successor to Hooker Chemical, paid $20 million in 1983 and another $129 million in 1995 toward remediation costs. Lois Gibbs went on to found the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, and her advocacy earned her the title Mother of the Superfund. The reason this matters is that one community's tragedy reshaped how America handles hazardous waste. The numbers behind the Superfund program reveal just how deep America's toxic waste crisis runs, 
and taken together, these figures paint a troubling picture. Between 1340 and 1343 sites remain on the active national priorities list as of 2025, with another 38 or 39 sites proposed for listing. More than 450 sites have been successfully cleaned and deleted. 21 million Americans live within one mile of a Superfund site, and 80 million live within three miles. Among black and Hispanic communities, one in four people live within three miles of hazardous waste. These aren't abstract statistics. They represent real exposure risks affecting entire generations of families. The contamination at these sites reads like a catalog of industrial chemistry's worst byproducts. Lead appears at 43% of sites, while trichloroethylene, a degreasing solvent linked to liver and kidney cancer, shows up at 42%. Chromium contaminates 35%, benzene 34%, and arsenic 28% of all listed locations. More than 600 different chemicals have been discovered across Superfund sites, and most locations contain complex mixtures rather than single pollutants. Groundwater contamination is particularly widespread, with 85% of sites where the EPA has selected remedies showing groundwater problems. Over 7,479 groundwater wells have been closed at contaminated sites across the country, which reveals how extensively industrial waste has infiltrated water supplies that communities once trusted. Research published by the University of Miami in 2025 found that women living near Superfund sites in Florida are 30% more likely to develop metastatic breast cancer. That statistic alone justifies the billions spent on cleanup. In Texas, the State Department of State Health Services identified a cancer cluster near the San Jacinto River Waste Pit Superfund site in Harris County during February 2025, with residents showing abnormally high rates of leukemia, lung cancer, and lymphoma. California studies found that living within a quarter mile of a Superfund site quadrupled the risk of congenital heart defects in newborns, jumping from 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 250. Neural tube defect risk doubled at similar distances. The National Bureau of Economic Research determined that mothers living within 2,000 meters of a Superfund site before cleanup were 20 to 25 percent more likely to have babies with congenital anomalies. And the Urban Institute calculated that living near toxic waste sites reduces lifespans by an average of 1.2 years. What most people miss about these statistics is that they represent ongoing harm, not historical damage. At 114 Superfund sites, human exposure to contaminants remains classified as not under control, according to the Center for Public Integrity. New Jersey alone has 15 sites where human exposure continues uncontrolled, and 224 sites have groundwater migration that hasn't been contained. The cleanup is happening, it's just not happening fast enough. The Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington State dwarfs every other Superfund challenge in complexity and cost. This facility covers 586 square miles, roughly half the size of Rhode Island, and produced plutonium for America's nuclear weapons program from 1944 to 1989. The plutonium for the Trinity test and the bomb dropped on Nagasaki came from Hanford. That history left behind a contamination problem unlike anything else on the planet. 177 underground tanks at Hanford contain between 54 and 56 million gallons of radioactive waste, and by 1998, one-third of those tanks had leaked. 450 billion gallons of nuclear and chemical waste were disposed of at the site over decades of weapons production, contaminating 80 square miles of groundwater. The estimated cleanup cost ranges from $300 billion to $640 billion. Between 10 and 13,000 workers currently staff the site, and remediation will continue for decades more. What surprised me while researching this was that no other environmental cleanup anywhere in the world comes close to this scale. Rocky Flats in Colorado presents a different kind of cautionary tale. Located just 16 miles northwest of Denver, this facility manufactured plutonium triggers for nuclear warheads from 1952 until 1989 and major fires in 1957 and 1969 released plutonium into the surrounding area. On June 6, 1989, the FBI conducted the largest environmental raid in American history at Rocky Flats. 
Rockwell International pleaded guilty and paid an $18.5 million fine. The cleanup was originally estimated at $37 billion, but actual completion in 2006 cost approximately $7 billion. That's a rare success story in Superfund history. Today, over 5,000 acres have become the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. Though the central 385 acres remain a permanent Superfund site, closed to the public forever. Cleaning up a Superfund site costs approximately $43 million on average, though estimates range between $27 and $43 million, depending on methodology. Total spending through 2009, the first 29 years of the program, reached $35 billion. Estimates suggest that cleaning all current and expected national priorities list sites will require between $60 and $90 billion more. Program funding has followed a complicated path that reveals changing priorities over the decades. Excise taxes on chemical and petroleum industries originally covered most costs, embodying the principle that polluters should pay for their damage. But that tax authority expired at the end of 1995, and by the end of fiscal year 2003, the original trust fund was exhausted. American taxpayers increasingly bore the burden during the gap years. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021 injected $3.5 billion into Superfund cleanup, representing one of the largest investments in American history for addressing legacy pollution. The first billion dollars cleared an entire backlog of 49 previously unfunded sites, and approximately 80% of that initial funding went to communities with environmental justice concerns. The law also reinstated Superfund chemical excise taxes, effective July 1, 2022 generating $1.44 billion in fiscal year 2023. These taxes remain authorized through December 31, 2031. Despite all the challenges, the Superfund program has achieved real results that deserve recognition. EPA data from 2023 shows that more than 10,260 businesses now operate on reused Superfund sites, employing over 237,000 people. These businesses generate $71.4 billion in annual sales and provide $18.8 .8 billion in combined annual employment income. Contaminated wastelands have become economic engines. Some transformations seem almost impossible given the original contamination. The Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado was once a chemical weapons facility, and it now operates as a 15,000-acre national wildlife refuge hosting more than 330 species including bison, black-footed ferrets, and bald eagles. In Montana, the Milltown Reservoir site required removing 3 million tons of contaminated sediment and demolishing a dam, which resulted in a 500-acre state park with a restored natural river. The former chemical commodities site in Kansas now hosts a pollinator habitat garden and monarch butterfly sanctuary, while Indiana's Riley Tar and Chemical site hosts the country's largest utility-scale solar development on a Superfund site, with over 36,000 panels producing 10.8 megawatts of electricity. Times Beach, Missouri offers another complete transformation story. During the early 1970s, a waste hauler mixed dioxin-contaminated waste with used motor oil and sprayed it on roads for dust control, which sounds insane by today's standards. Testing found dioxin levels exceeding 100 parts per billion. The EPA considers one part per billion hazardous. The town of 2,500 people was evacuated and eventually disincorporated. 265,000 tons of contaminated material from 27 Missouri sites were incinerated, and cleanup costs ran between $110 and $200 million. Today, that site is Route 66 State Park. The math of devastation can actually reverse. April 2024 brought a landmark decision when the EPA designated two PFOA and PFOS chemicals as hazardous substances under Superfund law. These so-called forever chemicals appear at more than 160 Superfund sites, and this designation expands cleanup authority significantly. Fiscal year 2024, enforcement secured over $1.1 billion in commitments from potentially responsible parties and recovered $28.5 million for past cleanup costs at 71 sites. The program continues generating results. Climate change introduces new complications that nobody anticipated when Superfund was created.
Approximately 60% of National Priorities List sites sit in areas potentially impacted by wildfires, flooding, storm surge, or sea level rise. About 2 million Americans live within one mile of 327 Superfund sites in flood-prone areas, which means extreme weather events could spread contamination that's currently contained. Geographic distribution of sites remains uneven across the country. New Jersey leads with between 113 and 115 sites, followed by California with 97 and Pennsylvania with 95. North Dakota has none. This detail changes how we should think about regional industrial legacies and their long-term consequences. Lois Gibbs started knocking on doors in Love Canal nearly 50 years ago, documenting health problems that her neighbors had quietly suffered for years. She couldn't have imagined she was helping launch a cleanup effort spanning generations and costing tens of billions of dollars. The program born from that crisis has now cleaned up over 450 of America's most contaminated sites while more than 1,300 remain on the active list. Damage from decades of industrial contamination runs deep, both in the soil and groundwater of these sites and in the health of surrounding communities. 21 million Americans still live within a mile of a Superfund site. The average cleanup still takes more than 10 years. Hanford will require centuries of monitoring. But weapons factories have become wildlife refugees. Toxic dumps have become solar farms and butterfly sanctuaries and former industrial wastelands now support over 237,000 jobs with billions of dollars in economic activity. The Superfund story ultimately comes down to choices. Choices made decades ago to bury toxic waste in communities across America, and choices being made today to clean it up. The true cost of industrial pollution isn't measured only in dollars. It's measured in generations. If you found this video informative, Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so you don't miss our next deep dive into the stories behind America's biggest engineering and environmental challenges.